This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping in the snow to keep their feet warm. At last, they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside. It seemed, as the mole remarked to the rat, like someone walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him down at the heel, which was intelligent of mole because that is exactly what it was. There was the noise of a bolt shot back, and the door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinking eyes. Now, the very next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time? Disturbing people on such a night. Speak up. Oh, Badger, cried the rat. Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole. We've lost our way in the snow. What? Ratty, my dear little man exclaimed the badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you at once. Why, you must be perished. Well, I never. Lost in the snow, and in the wild wood, too, and at this time of night. Come in with you. The two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside, and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. The badger wore a dressing gown, and his slippers were indeed very down at the heel, They carried a flat candlestick in their paw, and he had probably been on his way to bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them, and patted both their heads. "'This is not the sort of night for small animals to be out,' he said paternally. "'I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again, Ratty. But come along. Come into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire there. Supper and everything.' He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light. They followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long, tunnel-like passages branching, passages mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors in the hall as well. Stout, oaken, comfortable-looking doors. One of these the badger flung open, and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large, violet kitchen. The floor was well-worn red brick, and on the wide hearth burnt a fire of logs. Between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, well out of any suspicion of draught, a couple of high-backed settees, facing each other on either side of the fire, gave further sitting accommodation for the sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles, with benches down each side. At one end of it, where an armchair stood pushed back, were spread the remains of the badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table and keep their harvest home with mirth and song, or where two or three friends of simple tastes could sit about as they pleased, and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The ruddy brick floor smiled up at the smoky ceiling. Plates on the dresser grinned at pots on the shelf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settee to toast themselves at the fire, and bade them remove their wet coats and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers, and himself bathed the mole's shin with warm water, and mended the cut with sticking plaster, till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better. In the embracing light and warmth, 
warm and dry at last, with weary legs propped up in front of them and a suggestive clink of plates being arranged on the table behind. It seemed to the storm-driven animals now in safe anchorage that the cold and trackless wild wood just left outside was miles and miles away, and all that they had suffered in it a half-forgotten dream. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the table, where he had been busy laying a repast. They had felt pretty hungry before, but when they actually saw at last the supper that was spread for them, really it seemed only a question of what they should attack first, where all was so attractive, and whether the other things would obligingly wait for them till they had time to give them attention. Conversation was impossible for a long time, and when it slowly resumed, it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full. The badger did not mind that sort of thing at all, nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table or everybody speaking at once. As he did not go into society himself, he had got an idea that these things belonged to the things that didn't really matter. We know, of course, that he was wrong and took too narrow a view, because they do matter very much, though it would take too long to explain why. He sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story. He did not seem surprised or shocked at anything, and never said, I told you so, or just what I always said, or remarked that they ought to have done so and so, or ought not to have done something else. The mole began to feel very friendly towards him. When supper was really finished at last, and each animal felt that his skin was as tight as was decently safe, and that by this time he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything, they gathered around the glowing embers of the great wood fire, and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late and so independent, and so full and after they had chatted for a time about things in general, the badger said heartily, Now then, tell us the news from your part of the world. How's old Toad going on? Ah, oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely, while the mole cocked up on a settee and, basking in the firelight, his heels higher than his head, tried to look properly mournful. Another smash-up only last week, and a, a bad one, you see. He will insist on driving himself, and he's hopelessly incapable. If he'd only employ a decent, steady, well-trained animal and pay him good wages and leave everything to him, he'd get on all right, but he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver and nobody can teach him anything, and all the rest follows. How many has he had? inquired the badger gloomily. Smashes or machines? asked the rat. Oh, well, after all, it's the same thing with Toad. This is the seventh. As for the others, you know, that coach house of his, it's uh, piled up. It's, it's literally piled up to the roof with fragments of motor cars, none of them bigger than your hat. That accounts for the other six, so far, that can be accounted for. He's been in hospital three times, put in the mole, and as for the fines he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. Yeah, and that's part of the trouble, continued the rat. Toad's rich, we all know, but he's not a millionaire, and he's a hopelessly bad driver, quite regardless of law and order. Killed or ruined, it's got to be one of the two things sooner or later, Badger. We're his friends, or we do something. The Badger went through a bit of hard thinking. Now, look here, he said at last, rather severely. Of course you know I can't do anything now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No animal, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic, or even moderately active during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy, some actually asleep. All are weather-bound, more or less, and all are resting from arduous days and nights, during which every muscle in them has been severely tested and every energy kept at full stretch. Very well, then, continued the badger, but when once the year has really turned and the nights are shorter, halfway through them one rouses and feels fidgety, wanting to be up and doing by sunrise, if not before, you know. 
Both animals nodded gravely. They knew. Well then, went on the badger. We, that is, you and me, and our friend the mole here, we'll take Toad seriously in hand. We'll stand no nonsense whatever. We'll bring him back to reason, by force if need be. We'll make him be sensible, Toad. Well, you're asleep, Rat. Not me, said the Rat, waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times since supper, said the Mole, laughing. He himself felt quite wakeful and even lively, though he didn't know the reason was, of course, that he being naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding, the situation of Badger's house exactly suited him and made him feel at home. While the Rat, who slept every night in a bedroom with the windows of which opened on a breezy river, naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive. Well, it's time we were all in bed, said the Badger, getting up and fetching flat candlesticks. Come along, you two. I'll show you your quarters. Take your time tomorrow morning. Breakfast at any hour you please. He conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber, half loft. The badger's winter stores, which indeed were visible everywhere, took up half the room. Piles of apples, turnips, potatoes, baskets full of nuts, jars of honey. The two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting. The linen on them, though coarse, was clean and smelt beautifully of lavender. The mole and the water rat, shaking off their garments in some thirty seconds, tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment. In accordance with the kindly badger's injunctions, the two tired animals came down to breakfast very late the next morning, and found a bright fire burning in the kitchen, as well as two young hedgehogs sitting on a bench at the table, eating oatmeal porridge out of wooden bowls. The hedgehogs dropped their spoons, rose to their feet, and ducked their heads respectfully as the two entered. "'There, sit down, sit down,' said the rat pleasantly. "'Go on with your porridge. Where have you youngsters come from? Lost your way in the snow, I suppose?' "'Yes, please, sir,' said the elder of the two hedgehogs respectfully. "'Me and little Billy here. We was trying to find our way to school. Mother would have us to go, but the weather ever so, and we lost ourselves, sir. Billy, he got frightened, and took and cried, being young and faint-hearted, and at last we happened upon Mr. Badger's back door, and made so bold as to knock, sir, for Mr. Badger, he's a kind-hearted gentleman, as everyone knows. I understand, said the rat, cutting himself some rashers from a side of bacon, whilst the mole dropped eggs into a saucepan. What's the weather like outside? Uh, you needn't stir me quite so much, he added. Oh, terrible bad, sir, terrible bad the snow is. No getting out for the likes of you gentlemen today. Where's Mr. Badger? inquired the Mole as he warmed the coffee pot by the fire. The master's gone to his study, sir, replied the hedgehog. He said as how he was going to be particular busy this morning, and so on no account was he to be disturbed. This explanation, of course, was thoroughly understood by everyone present, the fact is, as already set forth, when you live a life of intense activity for six months of the year, and of comparative or actual somnolence for the other six, during the latter period you cannot be continually pleading sleepiness when there are people or about or things to be done. The excuse gets monotonous. The animals well know that Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, had retired to his study, and settled himself in an armchair with his legs up, on another, and a red cotton handkerchief over his face, and was being busy in the usual way at this time of year. The front door bell clanged loudly, and the rat, who was very greasy with buttered toast, sent Billy, the smaller hedgehog, to see who it might be. There was a sound of much stamping in the hall, and presently Billy returned in front of an otter, who threw himself on the rat with an embrace and a shout of affectionate greeting. "'Get off!' spluttered the rat with his mouth full. "'Thought I might find you here all right,' said the otter cheerfully. "'They were all in a great state of alarm along the river bank when I arrived this morning. "'Rat never been home all night, nor mole either. "'Something dreadful must have happened,' they said, "'and the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course. 
but I knew that when people were in any fix that mostly they went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow, so I came straight off here, through the wild woods and the snow. My, it was fine coming through the snow as the red sun was rising, showing against the black tree trunks it was. As you went along in the stillness, every now and then masses of snow slid off the branches suddenly with a flop, making you jump and run for cover. Snow castles and snow caverns had sprung up out of nowhere in the night. Snow bridges, terraces, ramparts. I could have stayed and played with them for hours. Here and there, great branches had been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow, and robins perched and hopped on them in their perky, conceited way, just as if they had done it themselves. A ragged string of wild geese passed overhead, high on the grey sky. A few rooks whirled over the trees, inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression, but I met no sensible being to ask for news. About halfway across I came on a rabbit sitting on a stump, cleaning his silly face with his paws. He was a pretty scared animal, when I crept up behind him and placed a heavy forepaw on his shoulder. I had to cuff his head once or twice to get any sense out of it. At last I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wild wood last night by one of them. It was the talk of the burrows, he said, how Mole, Mr. Rat's particular friend, was in a bad fix, how he had lost his way, and they were up and out hunting, and were chivying him round and round. Then why didn't any of you do something, I asked. You mayn't be blessed with brains, but there's hundreds and hundreds of you big stout fellows as fat as butter and your burrows running in all directions. You could have taken him in and made him safe and comfortable, or tried to at all events. What us, he merely said, do something, us rabbits. So I cuffed him again, and I left him. There was nothing else to be done. At any rate, I had learnt something, and if I had the luck to meet any of them, I'd have learnt something more, or they would. Weren't you at all, uh, nervous? asked the Mole, some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the Wildwood. Nervous? The Otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth as he laughed. I'd give him nerves if any of them tried anything on with me. Here, Mole, fry me some slices of ham like a good little chap that you are. I'm frightfully hungry, and I've got any amount to say to Ratty here. Haven't seen him for an age. So the good-natured Mole, having cut some slices of ham, set the hedgehogs to fry it, and returned to his own breakfast, while the Otter and the Rat, their heads together, eagerly talked River Shop, which is Long Shop, and talk that is endless, running on like a babbling river itself. A plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more when Badger entered, yawning and rubbing his eyes. He greeted them all in his quiet, simple way, with kind inquiries for every one. Mm -hmm. It must be getting on for luncheon time, he remarked to the otter. Better stop and have it with us. You must be hungry this cold morning. Rather, replied the otter, winking at the mole. The sight of these greedy young hedgehogs stuffing themselves with fried ham makes me feel positively famished. The hedgehogs, who were just beginning to feel hungry again after their porridge, and after working so hard at their frying, looked timidly up at Mr. Badger, but were too shy to say anything. Here, yeah. you two youngsters be off home to your mother, said the Badger kindly. I'll send someone with you to show you the way. You won't want any dinner today, I'll be bound. He gave them sixpence apiece and a pat on the head and they went off with much respectful swinging of caps and touching of forelocks. Presently they all sat down to luncheon together, the Mole himself placed next to Mr. Badger, and as the other two were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them, he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt to him. Once you're underground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you. Nothing can get at you. You're entirely your own master, and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say. Things go on all the same overhead, and you let them, and don't bother about them. When you want to, up you go, and there things are, waiting for you. The badger simply beamed on him. That's exactly what I say, he replied. There's no security or 
peace and tranquility except underground. And then, if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why, a dig and a scrape, and there you are. If you feel your house is a bit too big, you stop up a hole or two, and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on you by fellows looking over your wall, and above all, no weather. Look at Rat now, a couple of feet of flood water, and he's got to move into hired lodgings, uncomfortable, inconveniently situated, horribly expensive. Take Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall. Quite the best house in these parts as a house. But suppose a fire breaks out. Where's Toad? Supposing tiles are blown off, or walls sink or crack, or windows get broken. Where's Toad? Suppose the rooms are draughty. I hate a draught myself. Where's Toad? No, up and out of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last. That's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily, and the badger in consequence got very friendly with him. When lunch is over, he said, I'll take you all round this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be, you do. After luncheon, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and started a heated argument on the subject of eels, the badger lighted a lantern and bade them all to follow him. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels. The wavering light of the lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms both large and small, some mere cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right angles led them into another corridor. Here the same thing was repeated. The mole was staggered at the size, the extent, the ramifications of it all, the length of the dim passages, the solid vaultings of the crammed store chambers, the masonry everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. "'How on earth, Badger,' he said at last, "'did you ever find time and strength to do all this. It's astonishing." "'It would be astonishing indeed,' said the Badger simply, "'if I had done it. But as a matter of fact, I did none of it. I only cleaned out the passages and chambers as far as I had need of them. There's lots more of it all around about. I see you don't understand, and I must explain it to you. Well, very long ago, on the spot where the wild wood waves now, before ever it had planted itself and grown up to what it is now, there was a city, a city of people, you know. Here, where we are standing, they lived and walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. Here they stabled their horses, they feasted, from here they rode out to fight or drove out to trade. They were a powerful people, and rich, and great builders. They built to last, for they thought their city would last forever. But what's become of them all? asked the mole. Who can tell? said the badger. People come. They stay for a while. They flourish. They build and they go. It is their way, but we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before that same city ever came to be, and now there are badgers here again. We are an enduring lot. We may move out for a time, but we wait, and are patient, and back we come, and so it will ever be. Well, and when they went at last, those people, said the mole. When they went, continued the badger. The strong winds, persistent rains, took the matter in hand. Patiently, ceaselessly, year after year. Perhaps we badgers too, in our small way, helped a little, who knows. It was all going down, 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 gradually, ruin, 
leveling and disappearance. Then it was all up, 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 gradually, as seeds grew to saplings and saplings to forest trees and bramble and fern came creeping to help. Leaf mould rose and obliterated. Streams in their winter freshets brought sand and soil to clog, to cover, and in course of time our home was ready for us again, and we moved in. Up above us on the surface the same thing happened. Animals arrived, liked the look of the place and took up their quarters, settled down, spread and flourished. They didn't bother themselves about the past, they never do. They're too busy. The place was a bit humpy and hillocky, naturally, full of holes, and that was rather an advantage. They don't bother about the future either. The future, when perhaps people will move in again, for a time, as may very well be. The wild wood is pretty well populated now, with all the usual lot. Good, bad, indifferent. I name no names. It takes all sorts to make a world. But I fancy you know something about them yourself by this time. I do indeed, said the Mole with a shiver. Well, well, the Badger patted him on the shoulder. It was your first experience of them, you see. They're not so bad, really. We must all live and let live. I'll pass the word around tomorrow, and I think you'll have no further trouble. Any friend of mine walks where he likes in this country, or I'll know the reason why. When they got back to the kitchen again, they found the rat walking up and down, very restless. The underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves. He seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. He had his overcoat on and his pistols thrust into his belt again. "'Come along, Mole,' he said anxiously, as soon as he caught sight of them. "'We must get off while it's daylight. I don't want to spend another night in the wild woods again.' "'It'll be all right, my fine fellow,' said the otter. "'I'm coming along with you, and I know every path blindfold. "'And if there's a head that needs to be punched, "'you can confidently rely on me to punch it.' "'You really needn't fret, Ratty,' added the badger placidly. "'My passages run further than you think, "'and I've got bolt holes to the edge of the wood in several directions, "'though I don't care for everybody to know about them.' When you really have to go, you shall leave by one of my shortcuts. Meantime, make yourself easy and sit down again. The rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and attend to his river, so the badger, taking up his lantern again, led the way along a damp and airless tunnel that wound and dipped, part vaulted, part hewn through solid rock, for a weary distance that seemed to be miles. At last, daylight began to show itself, confusedly through tangled growth overhanging the mouth of the passage, and the badger, bidding them a hasty goodbye, pushed them hurriedly through the opening, made everything look as natural as possible again with creepers and brushwood and dead leaves, and retreated. They found themselves standing on the very edge of the wild wood. Rocks and brambles and tree roots behind them confusedly heaped and tangled in front, a great space of quiet fields hemmed by lines of hedges black on snow and far ahead a glint of a familiar old river, while the wintry sun hung red and low on the horizon. The otter, as knowing all the paths, took charge of the party, and they trailed out on a beeline from a distant stile. Pausing there a moment and looking back, they saw the whole mass of the wild wood, dense, menacing, compact, grimly set in vast white surroundings. Simultaneously they turned and made swiftly for home, for firelight, and familiar things that it played on, for the voice sounding cheerily outside their window, of the river that they knew and trusted in all its moods that never made them afraid with any amazement. 
as he hurried along, eagerly anticipating the moment when he would be at home again among the things he knew and liked. The Mole saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and hedgerow linked to the ploughed furrow, the frequented pasture, the lane of evening lingerings, the cultivated garden plot. For others, the asperities, the stubborn endurance, or the clash of actual conflict that went with nature in the rough. He must be wise, he must keep to the pleasant places in which his lines were laid, and which held adventure enough in their way to last for a lifetime. We continue with chapter 5. The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate four feet, their heads thrown back and a light steam rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air. As the two animals hastened by in high spirits with much chatter and laughter, they were returning across country after a long day's outing with Otter, hunting and exploring on the wide uplands where certain streams tributary to their own river had their first small beginnings. The shades of the short winter day were closing in on them, and they had still some distance to go. Plodding at random across the plough, they had heard the sheep and had made for them, and now, leading from the sheep pen, they found a beaten track that made walking a lighter business, and responded to that small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakably, yes, quite right, this leads home. It looks as if we were coming to a village, said the mole, somewhat dubiously, slackening his pace, the track that had in time become a path and had developed into a lane, now handed them over to the charge of a well-metalled road. The animals did not hold with villages, and their own highways, thickly frequented as they were, took an independent course, regardless of church, post office, or public house. Oh, never mind, said the rat. At this season of the year they're all safe indoors by this time, sitting round the fire. Men, women, children, dogs and cats and all. We shall slip through all right, without any bother or unpleasantness, and we can have a look at them through their windows if you like, see what they're doing. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible, but squares of a dusky orange-red on either side of the street, where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low latisse windows were innocent of blinds. To the lookers-in from outside, the inmates, gathered around a tea-table, absorbed in handiwork or talking with laughter and gesture. They had each that happy grace, which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture. The natural grace which goes with perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theatre to another, the two spectators so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes. They watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smouldering log. But it was from one little window, with its blind drawn down, a mere blank transparency on the night, that the sense of home and the little curtained world within walls, the larger stressful world of outside nature shut out and forgotten, most pulsated. 
close against the white blind hung a bird cage, clearly silhouetted. Every wire and perch was distinct and recognizable, even to yesterday's dull edged lump of sugar. On the middle perch, the fluffy occupant, head tucked well into feathers, seemed so near to them as to be easily stroked had they tried. Even the delicate tips of his plumped-out plumage penciled plainly on the illuminated screen. As they looked, the sleepy little fellow stirred uneasily, woke, shook himself, and raised his head. They could see the gape of his tiny beak as he yawned in a bored sort of way, looked around and settled his head into his back again, where ruffled feathers gradually subsided into a perfect stillness. Then a gust of bitter wind took them in the back of the neck, a small sting of frozen sleet on the skin. It woke them as from a dream, and they knew their toes to be cold and their legs tired, and their own home was a distant weary way. Once beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, on either side of the road they could smell through the darkness those friendly fields again. They braced themselves for the last long stretch, the home stretch, the stretch that we know is bound to end sometime. In the rattle of the door latch, in the sudden firelight, the sight of familiar things greeting us as long-absent travellers from far over sea. They plodded along, steadily, silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a good deal on supper. As it was pitch dark and it was all a strange country for him as far as he knew, he was following obediently in the wake of the rat leaving the guidance entirely to him. As for the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as was his habit. His shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on the straight grey road in front of him. He did not notice poor Mole when suddenly the summons reached him and took him like an electric shock. We others who have long lost the more subtle of the physical senses have not even the proper terms to express an animal's intercommunications with his surroundings, living or otherwise. We have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose of the animal night and day, summoning warning, inciting, repelling. It was one of those mysterious fairy calls from out the void that had suddenly reached the mole in the darkness, making him tingle through and through with its very familiar appeal, even while yet he could not clearly remember what it was. He stopped dead in his tracks, his nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture this fine filament, the telegraphic current that had so strongly moved him. A moment, and he had caught it again, and with it this time came recollection in its fullest flood. Home. That was what they meant. Those caressing appeals, those... Soft touches wafted through the air, those invisible little hands pulling and tugging all one way. Why, it must be quite close by him at the moment. His old home, that he had hurriedly forsaken and never sought again, that day when he first found the river. And now it was sending out its scouts and its messengers to capture him and bring him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he had hardly given it a thought. So absorbed had he been in his new life, in all of its pleasures and its surprises, 
its fresh and captivating experiences. Now, with a rush of old memories, how clearly it stood up before him in the darkness. Shabby indeed, small and poorly furnished, and yet his, the home that he had made for himself, the home he had been so happy to get back to after a day's work. The home had been happy with him too, evidently, and was missing him. It wanted him back, and it was telling him so, through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only with plaintive reminder that it was there, and that it wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain. He must obey it instantly, and go. Ratty, he called, full of joyful excitement. Hold on, uh, come back, I want you, quick. Oh, come along, Mole, do, replied the Rat cheerfully, still plodding along. Please stop, Ratty, pleading the poor Mole in anguish of heart. You don't understand, it's my home, my old home. I've just come across the smell of it. It's close by here, really quite close, and I must go to it. I must, I must. Oh, come back, Ratty. Please, please come back. The Rat was by this time very far ahead, too far to hear clearly what the Mole was calling, too far to catch the sharp note of painful appeal in his voice, and he was much taken up with the weather, for he too could smell something, something suspiciously like approaching snow. Mole, we mustn't stop now, really, he called back. We'll come for it tomorrow, whatever it is you found. But I daren't stop now. It's late, and the snow's coming on again, and I'm not sure of the way. And I want your nose, Mole, so come on quick, there's a good fellow. The rat pressed forward on his way without waiting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road. His heart was torn asunder. A big sob was gathering, gathering, somewhere low down inside him. To leap up to the surface presently, he knew, in passionate escape. But even under such a test as this, his loyalty to his friend stood firm. Never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile, the wafts from his old home pleaded, whispered, conjured, and finally claimed him imperiously. He dared not tarry longer within their magic circle, with a wrench that tore his very heartstrings. He set his face down the road, and followed submissively, in the track of the rat, while faint, thin little smells dogged at his retreating nose, reproaching him for his new friendship and his callous forgetfulness. With an effort he caught up to the unsuspecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they would do when they got back, how jolly a fire of logs in the parlour would be what a supper he meant to eat. Never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind. At last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, Look here, mole, old chap. You seem dead tired. No talk left in you. Your feet are dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a moment and rest. The snow's held off so far. The best part of our journey's over. The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried to control himself. He felt it surely coming. The sob that he had fought with so long refused to be beaten. Up and up 
it forced its way to the air, and then another, and another, and others thick and fast, until poor Mole at last gave up the struggle, and cried freely and helplessly and openly, now that he knew it was all over, and that he had lost what he could hardly have said to have found. The rat, astonished and dismayed at the violence of Mole's grief, did not speak for a while. At last he said, very quietly and sympathetically, "'What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter, tell us your trouble and let me see what I can do.' Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out between the upheavals of his chest that followed one upon another so quickly and held back speech and choked it as it came. I know it's a shabby, dingy little place, he sobbed forth at last, broken, not like your cosy quarters or Toad's beautiful hall or Badger's great house, but it was my own little home, and I was fond of it, and I went away, and I forgot all about it, and then I smelt it suddenly on the road. When I called, and you wouldn't listen, Rat, and everything came back to me with a rush, and I wanted it, oh dear, and when you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, and I had to leave it, though I was smelling it all the time, I, I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone and had one look at it, Ratty, only one look. It was close by, but you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, you wouldn't turn back. Recollection brought fresh waves of sorrow, and sobs again took full charge of him, preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I have been, a pig, that's me, just a pig, a plain pig. He waited until Mole's sobs became gradually less stormy and more rhythmical. He waited till a last sniffs were frequent and sobs were intermittent. He rose from his seat and, remarking carelessly, Well, we'd uh, really better be getting on, old chap, and set off up the road again, over the toilsome way that they had come. Wherever are you going to, Ratty? cried the tearful mole, looking up in alarm. We're going to find that home of yours, old fellow replied the rat pleasantly. So you'd better come along, for it'll take some finding, and we shall want your nose. Oh, come back, ratty, do, cried the mole, getting up and hurrying after him. It's no good, I tell you, it, it's too late and too dark, and the place is far off, the snow's coming. I, I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way about it. It was an accident and a mistake. Think of the river bank. "'And your supper?' "'Hang Riverbank and supper too,' said the rat heartily. "'I tell you, I'm going to find this place now if I stay out all night. "'So cheer up, old chap, and take my arm. "'We'll soon be back there again.' "'Still snuffling and pleading and reluctant, "'the mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road "'by his imperious companion, who by a flow of cheerful talk and anecdote endeavoured to beguile his spirits back and make the weary way seem shorter. When at last it seemed to the rat that they must be nearing the part of the road where the mole had been held up, he said, Now, no more talking. Business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for a little way. Suddenly, the rat was conscious, through his arm that was linked in the moles, of a faint sort of electric thrill, 
that was passing down that animal's body. Instantly, he disengaged himself and fell back a pace and waited. The signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment rigid. His uplifted nose, quivering slightly, felt the air. Then, a short, quick run forward. A fault, a check, a try-back, and then a slow and steady, confident advance. The rat, much excited, kept close to his heels as the mole, with something of the air of a sleepwalker, crossed a dry ditch scrambled through a hedge and nosed his way over a field open and trackless and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the rat was on alert and followed him down the tunnel, to which his unerring nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless. The earthy smell was strong. It seemed a long time to Rat ere the passage ended, and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. The Mole struck a match, and by its light the Rat saw that they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot. Directly facing them was Mole's little front door, with Mole End painted in gothic lettering over the bell pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it. The rat, looking around him, saw that they were in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and on the other, a roller. For the Mole, who was a tidy animal when at home, could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statuary. Gary Baldy and the infant Samuel, Queen Victoria and other heroes of modern Italy. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley, with benches along it and little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish, surrounded by a cockle-shell border. Out of the centre of the pond rose a fanciful erection clothed in more cockle-shells, topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong, and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of these objects so dear to him. He hurried Rat through the door, lit a lamp in the hall, and took one glance around his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of a long-neglected house, its narrow dimensions, its worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. Oh, ratty, he cried dismally. Why ever did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this, when you might have been at Riverbank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire with all of your own nice things about you. The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, lighting lamps and candles and sticking them up everywhere. What a capital little house this is, he called out cheerfully. So compact, so well planned. Everything here and everything in its place. We'll make a jolly night out of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So this is the parlour? Splendid. Your own idea, those little sleeping bunks in the wall? Capital. Uh, now I'll fetch the wood and the coals and get a duster mole. 
you'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table. Try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his inspiriting companion, the mole roused himself, dusted and polished with energy and heartiness, while the rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He hailed the mole to come and warm himself, but mole promptly had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in a dark despair, burying his face in the duster. Rat, he moaned, how about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the rat reproachfully. Why, only just now, I, I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser, quite distinctly. Everybody knows that means there are sardines somewhere in the neighbourhood. Rouse yourself, pull yourself together, come with me and forage. They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard, turning out every drawer. The result was not so very depressing after all. Of course, it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of captain's biscuits nearly full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. "'There's a banquet for you,' observed the rat. He arranged the table. "'I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to supper with us tonight.' "'No bread,' groaned the mole. "'No butter, no... no pâté, no foie gras, no champagne,' continued the rat, grinning. "'And that reminds me. What's that little door at the end of the passage?' "'Your cellar, of course. Every luxury in the house. Just wait a minute.' He made for the cellar door, and presently reappeared, somewhat dusty, and with a bottle of beer in each paw, and another under each arm. "'Self-indulgent beggar you seem to be, Mole,' he observed. "'Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I ever was in. Wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so homelike, they do.' No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Uh, tell us all about it. How you came to make it what it is. And while the rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks and mustard, which he mixed in an egg cup, the Mole, his bosom heaving with the stress of recent emotion, related, somewhat shyly at first, but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject, how this was planned, how that was thought out, and how this was got through a windfall from an aunt. And that was a wonderful find and a bargain, and this other thing was brought out of laborious savings and a certain amount of going without. His spirits finally quite restored. He must needs go and caress his possessions. Take a lamp and show off their points to his visitor. Quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed, Rat, who was desperately hungry but strove to conceal it, nodded seriously, examining with a puckered brow and saying, wonderful and most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given. At last the Rat succeeded in decoying him to the table and had just got seriously to work with the sardine opener when sounds were heard from the forecourt. Sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel. A confused murmur of tiny voices, broken sentences reaching them. All in a line. Hold the lantern up a bit, Tommy. Clear your throats first. No coughing after I say one, two, three. Where's young Bill? Come on, we're all waiting. What's up? inquired the rat, pausing in his labours. I think it must be the field mice, replied the mole, a touch of pride in his manner. 
they go round carol singing regularly this time of year they're quite an institution in these parts and they never pass me over they come to mole end last i used to give them hot drinks and supper too when i could afford it it'll be like old times to hear them again let's have a look at them cried the rat jumping up and running to the door it was a pretty sight a seasonable one it met their eyes when they flung the door open in the forecourt lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle red comforters around their throats their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets feet jigging for warmth with bright beady eyes they glanced shyly at each other sniggering a little and sniffing applying coat sleeves a good deal as the door opened one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying now then one two three and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers had composed in the fields that were fallow and held by frost or when snowbound in chimney corners handed down to be sung in the street to lamplit windows at yule time villagers all this frosty tide let your doors swing open wide though wind may follow and snow beside draw us in by your fire to bide joy shall be yours in the morning here we stand in the cold and the sleet blowing fingers and stamping feet come from far away you to greet you by the fire we in the street bidding you joy in the morning for ere one half of the night was gone sudden a star has led us on raining bliss and benison bliss tomorrow and more anon joy for every morning goodman joseph toiled through the snow saw the star over a stable low mary she might not further go welcome thatch and litter below joy was hers in the morning and then they heard the angels tell who were the first to cry noel animals all as it befell in the stable where they did dwell joy shall be theirs in the morning the voices ceased the singers bashful but smiling exchanged sidelong glances and silence succeeded but for a moment only from up above and far away down the tunnel that they had so lately traveled was borne to their ears in a faint musical hum the sound of distant bells ringing a joyful peal very well sung boys cried the rat heartily and now come along in all of you warm yourselves by the fire and have something hot yes uh, come along field mice cried the mole eagerly this is quite like old times shut the door after you uh, pull up that settee to the fire just wait a minute while we ratty he cried in despair plumping down on a seat with tears impending whatever are we doing we've got nothing to give them you leave that to me said the masterful rat here you with the lantern come this way i want to talk to you tell me are there any shops open at this hour of the night why certainly sir replied the field mouse respectfully at this time of year our shops keep open to all sorts of hours then look here said the rat you go off at once you and your lantern and you get me here much muttered conversation ensued the mole only heard bits of it such as fresh mind and 
No, a pound of that will do. See you get Bugginses, for I won't have any other. Only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Of course, homemade. No tinned stuff. Do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice perched in a row on the settee, their small legs swinging, giving themselves up to the enjoyment of the fire. They toasted their chilblains until they tingled, while the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them recite the names of numerous brothers who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to carol that year. But they looked forward to very shortly after winning a parental consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label of one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be an old burn, he remarked approvingly. Sensible mole, the very thing. Now we'll be able to mull some ale. Get things ready, mole, whilst I draw the corks. It did not take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater into the red heart of the fire. Soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled ale goes a long way. Wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting that he had ever been cold in all of his life. They act plays too, these fellows, the mole explained. Make them all up by themselves and act them afterwards. Very well they do too. They gave us a capital one last year as a field mouse who was captured at sea. Made to row in a galley. When he escaped and got home again, his lady love had gone into a convent. You, you were in it, I, I remember. Uh, come on, get up and recite a bit. The field mouse addressed got up on his legs, giggled shyly, and looked around the room. He remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on, Mole coaxed and encouraged him, and the rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him. But nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busily engaged on him, like watermen applying the Royal Humane Society's regulations to a case of long submersion. When the latch clicked, the door opened, and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. There was no more talk of play-acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had tumbled out onto the table. Under the general ship of Rat, everybody was set to do something or to fetch something. In a very few minutes, supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table in a sort of dream, saw a lately barren board set thick with savoury comforts, saw his little friend's faces brighten and beam as they fell to without delay, and let himself loose for he was famished indeed. On the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out. As they ate, they talked of old times. The field mice gave him the local gossip and answered as well as they could the hundred questions that he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing only taking care that each guest had what he wanted, and plenty of it, and that Mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful, showering wishes of the season with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for small brothers and sisters at home. When the door closed on the last of them, and the chink of the lanterns had died away, Mole and Rat kicked the fire up, drew the chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of mulled ale, and discussed the events of the long day. At last the Rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, 
Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, I'll, I'll take this. What a ripping little house this is. Everything's so handy. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in the blankets. Slumber gathered him forthwith as a swathe of barley folded into the arms of a reaping machine. The weary mole was glad to turn in without delay. Soon his head was on his pillow, in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things, which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and now smilingly received him back. He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even it all was, but clearly too how much it all meant to him. The special value of some anchorage in one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon the new life and its splendid spaces, to turn his back on the sun and the air, and all that it offered him to creep home and stay there. The upper world was all too strong. It called to him still, even down there. He knew he must return to the larger stage. But it was good to think that he had this to come back to this place which was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again, and could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome.